So you're listening to Ask Your Herb Doctor on KMUD Garberville 91.1 FM and from 7.30 until the end of the show at 8 o'clock you're invited to call in with any questions either related or unrelated to this month's subject of energetic interactions of ionising and non-ionising radiations. So the number here if you live in the area is 923-3911 or if you live outside the area the toll-free number, there's 1-800-568-3723 or 1-800-KMUD-RAD. And we can also be reached toll-free on 1-888-WBM-ERB for further questions during normal business hours Monday through Friday. And we're also once again very pleased to welcome Dr. Ray Peake to the show to share his knowledge on the subject and to offer alternative strategies for maintaining, maintaining rather good health. So by the term non ionizing radiation we mean that uh, type of radiation that doesn't carry enough energy uh, to ionize atoms or molecules uh, that is to remove an electron from them uh, whereas the ionizing has a sufficiently high energy um, basically to remove electrons and uh, basically damage DNA etc so even uh, non ionizing types are certainly under question and so can you give us some examples of non ionizing and Ionizing radiation? Yeah, well, the non-ionizing types would be things like uh, radio waves, microwaves, uh, up to up to the infrared. And then the ionizing types would be uh, ultraviolet uh, radiation uh, from the sun, for example, uh, X-rays and gamma rays and that kind of stuff. And they're the ones that really damage DNA. Uh, whereas the non-ionizing radiation per se doesn't damage DNA, but doesn't, it definitely has excitatory effects that can be very damaging. And a recent article uh, published in Science Daily, uh, November 13th, 2012, uh, reports that even low-level radioactivity is damaging, and even the very lowest levels of radiation are harmful to life. So the scientists uh, concluded this at the Cambridge Philosophical Society's uh, journal, The Biological Review, and they reported that the uh, results of a wide-ranging analysis of uh, 46 peer-reviewed studies published over the past 40 years, uh, researchers from the University of South Carolina and the University of Paris South found that variation in low-level natural background radiation was found to have small but highly statistical significant negative effects on DNA as well as several other measures of health. So... No levels of radiation are safe. Uh, I know that the. And I've uh, heard plenty of doctors tell me directly that you can withstand a certain amount of radiation and it's perfectly harmless, like a certain number of chest x rays per year, a certain number of dental x rays, but uh, John Goffman disproved that already. And now some more research is coming out saying that no level is safe. There's no threshold at which there's no negative effect beneath. So the levels have continually come down from uh, post war. Uh, uh, units to uh, the present date that definitely have come down uh, quite quite significantly but obviously there's still uh, measurable differences uh, in exposure okay so um, I don't know if we've got Dr. Pete actually on the show at the moment if he's still being contacted or not let me just see if he is no I guess he doesn't okay all right well until until we can get Dr. Pete on the line uh, we'll just uh, continue uh, what we have here, although much of what we've got is... You've got no choice. <laughs> okay, what's happening then? Okay, all right. So I guess until we have Dr. Pete uh, joining us, the, um, uh, the main things we wanted to talk about were the uh, effects of non-ionizing radiation uh, and that the uh, recent research showing that no levels are safe and how the uh, radiation interferes with cell processes and the excitation that occurs uh, can be mediated in part or the effects can be in part reduced by the uh, uh, substances like uh, pregnenolone, progesterone. Uh, testosterone in fact also has a similar effect and that uh, other hormones that uh, were definitely associated with inflammation, things like estrogen, are particularly damaging because they have a very uh, potentiating effect uh, to what would normally be experienced by the organism. Uh, estrogen itself is actually a, a significant magnifier of the negative effects. So much of the environmental uh, pollution that's happened 
over the last 50 years with plastics and the petrochemical industry, etc. And, um, and radiation. Yeah, and of course the radiation testing <coughs> that's happened since the 50s. Uh, all of this has been a major burden to uh, us as organisms. And also the uh, other thing I think that we'll try and bring out later on in the show is that the um, science of uh, photobiology, uh, where science is now looking at light as a very significant uh, player in the, uh, in, 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 the, in the role of good health. And that I know we brought out in past shows that uh, red light has a significant free radical quenching effect. And I know Dr. Peter's been a, a pretty big proponent of red light. And there's been plenty of uh, studies to show that the uh, free radical quenching effects of red light can have very significant effects uh, to prevent cancers, etc. So um, I don't know if you have Dr. Pete on the line. He is. I, okay, yes, good. I, I was hearing the first part of what you said, but you couldn't hear me. <laughs> okay. And then I missed the, the second part. Okay, we're very, very happy to have you with us, Dr. Pete. I think, as usual, uh, there's always uh, a group of people, perhaps, who've never listened to the show before. So um, I'm sure they would uh, definitely benefit from hearing your academic background uh, in regards to what we're going to be talking about tonight. Oh, okay. Um, from 1968 to 72, I studied biology, uh, reproductive physiology, and biochemistry at the University of Oregon for a PhD. But uh, my first teaching uh, job was 1959-1960, uh, uh, and the main course was called uh, Physics for Biology Majors. And the main content of that had to do with the interactions of uh, radiant energy with uh, matter. And uh, so it, it covered things like photosynthesis and uh, nuclear fallout, uh, uh, sunburn, and so on. All the ways in which radiant energy can interact with, with matter was, was a big part of the course. And before that, I had been following the, the government's uh, doctrines about the safety of, of the fallout from atomic bomb tests. Mm -hmm. And just about the same time, uh, the government was, uh, they, they found that uh, in the Navy, uh, some people were injured or killed by working around radars. And uh, that got me interested in the effects of, of microwave radar frequencies. Uh, they found that um, uh, if the wavelength was similar to the diameter of the person's head, uh, they could be uh, very quickly killed as their brain overheated. And uh, in experiments, they found that that same frequency uh, wouldn't kill animals with a small brain hmm. at, at the same level of exposure because it was a matter of resonance right. with the... Uh, properties and size of the uh, animal's head or the organ uh, so that uh, particular organs could be uh, overheated uh, according to the wavelength. So this, this is the excitation that the non-ionizing uh, form of radiation uh, um, produces. Yeah, yeah. and the, um, the U.S. government policy was um, based very largely on the work of um, Hermann Schwann, who was brought over from Nazi Germany uh, to work for the government, uh, explaining the safety of uh, microwave and radar uh, waves. And uh, he uh, knew that uh, the brain could be cooked by overexposure and that uh, okay. technicians sometimes would heat up their hot dogs <laughs> by putting them in the... Uh, radar in front of the radar antenna. Uh -huh. And so he argued that, that, that he wasn't a biologist at all. He was a physicist. And uh, he argued that that was the only danger from uh, radar or microwaves was uh, if it heated you up. And, and so he found that to heat up a beaker of salt water uh, noticeably uh, it required sitting in front of of the radar for um, oh, at least an hour at an intensity of um, at, 
around 100,000 microwatts per square centimeter. And so just to be safe, uh, he and the government said that uh, we'll set the safety limit at 10,000 microwatts per square centimeter. Okay. But meanwhile, or earlier, the uh, Soviets had been uh, having uh, technicians get sick working around radar, and uh, so they uh, did experiments to find out what the safe level was, and they determined that uh, only 10 microwatts should be allowed for technicians and only one microwatt per square centimeter uh, for the general public exposure. Well, that's a big difference from 10,000 from the beaker water experiment. Yeah. So um, where were the Russians testing humans and the Amer- uh, the Nazi German in America was testing water, beakers of water? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, the, um, the government knew about the dangers of uh, microwave radiation just as well as they, they knew about the uh, dangers of radioactive fallout. But uh, over the decades, uh, they, they would fire uh, employees who, who exposed the dangers of microwaves. Right. And uh, so until just about 20 years ago, that same 10,000 uh, microwatt standard uh, was recognized. And now it's down, I think, to about 1,000 microwatts. Okay, yeah, the, um, that uh, uh, recent November 13th article stating that the, uh, even the very lowest levels of radiation were harmful to life. Uh, what, do you, what do you have to say about that in terms of the uh, non-ionizing sources? I think we'll get into the non-ionizing radiation and talk a little bit more specifically about that and how um, that can be um, ameliorated or how we can uh, uh, do things to avoid exposure or, or lessen, the, lessen the exposure. Uh, There are reasons to think, uh, based on good evidence, that the lower limits of uh, interference with life uh, are produced at much, much lower uh, power levels than uh, anything that uh, people are now worried about. Mm -hmm. Uh, For example, one uh, study found that Uh, brain uh, electrical activity could resonate with a field if it was tuned properly with a field with an energy of only one billionth of a microwatt. Wow. Uh, Just an incredible difference. And... um, this, this in, sorry to interrupt you, but this interaction there may not necessarily be harmful, but just to say that, uh, that even at that level there was an interaction. Yeah, something yeah. is happening. Yeah. And uh, in animal experiments, uh, they know that they can interfere with the uh, orientation of bees and uh, pigeons, homing pigeons, okay. because to uh, right. uh, get lost if they put a magnet on them. Because they're using electromagnetic fields to guide themselves, aren't they? Uh, yeah. Or pigeons, uh, for sure. When the sun is obscured by clouds, they okay. rely on the magnetic fields. Uh-huh. Otherwise, they use the sun. Yeah. And uh, salamanders, I think, are about 100 times more sensitive to the fields. Wow. Uh, and uh, snails, uh, there have been many studies through the 50s and 60s of uh, the ability of organisms to sense these extremely mm-hmm. weak uh, environmental fields and resonances. Um, in the 50s and 60s, for example, human studies uh, done by the, I think it was the CIA, uh, found that if you shield a person from the Earth's resonant, a uh, very, very small uh, electromagnetic activity, uh, the brain waves become disorganized. Uh, hmm. In other words, uh, normal uh, alpha rhythms and, and uh, similar uh, brain oscillations in the, the 7 to uh, 12 cycle uh, frequencies, okay. uh, these are getting their cue from the Earth's resonance of the same frequency. Wow. Now, when they um, talk about, you talked about beta. In sleep, there's a theta wave, I think, that's about 12 
cycles per second that is associated no not sleep theta is uh, thought isn't it when people are thinking about things and they're focusing that's the uh, general uh, well-being uh, and thought based uh, brain wave and then there's the the beta is the sleep one isn't it I think that was the seven cycle that you were talking about um, the, um, if, if you drive uh, the brain with a, a signal uh, that is larger than the earth's resonant frequency okay. you can uh, cause the brain to uh, adjust its cycling or if you simply Put a person in a in a cave, isolated from the earth, mm. uh, with a, a metal shielding around them. Uh, all of their systems become desynchronized, uh, where normally each organ and system uh, coordinates with the others. Uh, when when you interfere with it, uh, the whole body loses its coordination. So the monthly cycles uh, get out of phase with the daily cycles. Mm -hmm. And those with the um, more frequent uh, hourly rhythms and so on. So, so the uh, something that interferes with our sensing of the Earth's rhythms uh, can have all of these effects on, for example, menstruation, fertility, uh, even mental clarity, mm -hmm. uh, uh, causing insomnia, uh, loss of ability to to concentrate, uh, and I think the the mental effects are, are probably already being seen. Uh, Michael Persinger, in a, a video that's on the Internet uh, called No More Secrets, he mentions that uh, the um, abnormal, uh, very common, uh, rare experiences uh, uh, extrasensory perception and such are tending to disappear from huh. uh, society. People aren't having those interesting uh -huh. experiences anymore. And he thinks it's because of the pollution, which right. is while the brain energy, uh, the oscillation of our nerve cells and such, uh, is just about at the same level of energy as the natural oscillations of the Earth's magnetic field, the pollution is thousands or millions of times more intense. <clears throat> so even though our brains can uh, tune in and select to a great extent uh, these very weak fields, uh, they are, the body is being influenced by this junk which yeah. is coming in at all kinds of frequencies. Yeah. Okay. Well, welcome uh, this month's uh, Ask Your Web Doctor. We're very pleased to have Dr. Raymond Pete join us on the show tonight from 7.30 till the end of the show. Uh, people can either call in with questions related or unrelated to this month's subject of the energetic interactions uh, with reference to non-ionizing as well as ionizing radiation. Uh, the number here if you live in the area is 9233911 or if you live outside the area, the number is uh, 1-800-KMUD-RAD. So, Dr. Pete, um, getting back to... Uh, the uh, cycles that you were talking about Ob obviously as uh, human beings i think everyone i think most thinking people recognize that um we are pretty complex creatures and that we've very much uh, grown fairly interwoven with the uh, environment in which we live and we are definitely affected uh, to a large degree um, by our environment and, and how uh, how we uh, damage it can also have effects uh, straight back at us. So you, you were mentioning the uh, Earth's natural magnetic uh, field. Uh, as a, did, you, did you say it was six, uh, six cycles a second? Um, uh, there, there are various parts of it. Uh, one important one is 10 or 11. Another important one is six or seven. Okay. So uh, do, am I right in thinking that the um, power, the most power transmission uh, stations are also running power at the same kind of frequency? Is um, that yeah, the, um, the standard house current at 60 cycles per second 60, right. is um, uh, close enough to our, our common uh, oscillations that it can have a very big effect. In Europe, it's uh, 50 cycles per second rather than 60. Okay. And uh, those are known to uh, affect the rate of cell division, 
uh, the rate of uh, developing blood vessels and so on. So if you use them in the right context, you can stimulate the growth of a broken bone or the uh, revascularization of, of an injured tissue. But if it's just happening at random, it is known to uh, increase the incidence of, of cancer, for example, promoting right. growth when it shouldn't. And um, many other kinds of biological disorganization, for example, Alzheimer's disease and uh, ALS, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, okay. uh, those are very well connected with uh, uh, the um, circuits level, level of uh, electromagnetic energy that lots of workers are exposed to, for example, from sewing machines. Okay. Uh, the incidence of Alzheimer's disease is three times higher among people who work wow. with machinery like that. Wow. So do you think that's like industrial sewing machines? Um, uh, well, yeah, uh, home sewing machines are uh, very similar. So this is because of the uh, motor. In the, you're talking about electric sewing machines now, I presume. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. So presumably the motor is generating fields sufficiently strong enough to interact in a negative way. Um, yeah, and the, the rhythm uh, is governed by the speed of the motor. Okay. And, and so you get these rhythms that are uh, on the order of uh, our, our own native rhythm uh, from a few per second up to... Uh, maybe a hundred per second. Mm -hmm. and, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I just wanted to ask you what other common household appliances have there been um, studies done showing an interaction, a negative interaction with uh, well, EMF uh, and human biology? You probably remember the, the thing about uh, electric blankets about 10 or 15 yeah. years ago yeah. causing cancer. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, even electric clocks, uh, having one uh, near your head while you sleep, uh, is probably uh, harmful. And uh, my electric, um, well, my electric, you know, little digital clock that I've had since I was probably 15 is um, reads danger when I put the EMF reader to it. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of the strongest things around the house is the. A fluorescent tube or fluorescent compact bulb. Uh -huh. Laptops are wow. another danger on the EMF yeah. reader. Well, what other things, Dr. Pete, that you're aware of? Oh, um, uh, electric shavers are connected with brain tumor. Electric shavers. Wow. What about um, those sonic toothbrushes? I haven't <laughs> seen a study of that, but uh, wow. uh, and hair, hair dryers and electric shavers oh, are electric definitely shavers. connected. Electric shavers. Okay, wow. so it's all to do with how close it's getting to your head, right? Yeah. So this this goes uh, this um, this uh, strengthens the uh, the argument uh, that uh, cell phone use uh, can uh, can lead to uh, some cerebral tumors because of being very close to your head in proximity for both uh, duration and um, intensity. Um. Yeah. Uh, about. Forty years ago, there was at one of the big electronic companies, uh, there, there, there were a few people in a lab working with a essentially a big dynamo sort of thing that had a pulsating magnetic field. Mm -hmm. And within just a few months of each other, uh, two of these employees uh, developed and died uh, from a, a, an astrocytoma. Wow. A brain very cancer. uncommon kind of brain tumor, yeah. and uh, brain tumors are are the probably the most most common uh, uh, wow. cancer other than leukemia. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. going back to leukemia, Doctor Pete, the uh, incidence is very statistically significant uh, with children born uh, contracting leukemia that are uh, localized around uh, high tension power lines. I mean, yeah, clusters but, yeah. of them occurring. Uh, any kind of a, a power line is a risk, but those uh, very powerful ones, I think it's uh, especially within 100 meters yeah. of, of the power line, it's, it's very dangerous.
Yeah. Now, I remember in and England, also, the, um, uh, unfortunately, I think because uh, of space or whatever it is, but I remember it's fairly common in, in certain urban areas in England to see uh, these electrical pylons uh, carrying high-tension voltage uh, to be in people's back gardens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're also <laughs> right associated with people living underneath those high-tension power lines have a higher incidence of multiple sclerosis. Now, then... And the radio and television broadcasting towers are major dangers uh, within a half a mile. Wow. Uh, you can uh, get into the, the toxic uh -huh. field strength. So if, if somebody lives in the city and they live near a radio or a broadcast or a telephone company, what would you recommend they do? If It's like put metal roofing on and, and the grounds? Um, yeah, I think um, if I live near a, either a, a power line or a, a telephone company headquarters, I would um, have a metal roof and probably some uh, uh, metal screens connecting between the roof and uh, some of the plumbing that's well grounded. Okay. All right. I think, I think what we're trying to bring out, I think, more than anything else uh, with this, uh, this show tonight, Dr. P, and I'm sure, I'm sure you'd agree with it, is that information is a valuable resource and that uh, whilst uh, in our society in 2012 it's uh, the best we can do in terms of uh, using these fields, etc., for communication or, or whatever else we're using. It, it's at this point, it's the it's the best option that we have. But I know um, you're very interested in light, and um, in terms of uh, communication, obviously fiber optics uh, jump out as a uh, means of transmitting data via light. And um, I wonder that uh, anything can be done uh, to further that to uh, to prevent uh, what we have at the moment is a kind of next best thing that we're dealing with in this technological uh, stage that we're at with our communications. I think as people become more conscious of uh, the seriousness of, of the question, uh, I think the yeah. pressure will uh, force the rapid development of right. fiber optics and, and uh, at least uh, having other uh, ways to uh, communicate with electricity and electromagnetics. I know in, in major cities, etc. I know in Europe, and I'm sure it's probably the same in the States, but that most major cities have uh, fiber, uh, fiber optic backbones running uh, in a ring or in a grid through the city that will uh, be a conduit for data transmission. I think we have a caller on the line, or maybe not. Uh, we actually lost them, but somebody else called in to say that the best way to protect yourself from the EMFs is to take the example of the Salmon Creek beaver and cut the poles down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So getting back to some uh, some uh, research uh, articles surrounding the uh, effects of EMF, Dr. Pete, I know you'd mentioned uh, Alzheimer's, and I think amyloid. Wasn't amyloid uh, deposition a, a significant uh, factor in or am I thinking of something different? I think uh, no. It, uh, the microwaves are able to uh, very quickly uh, increase the beta amyloid that's characteristic of Alzheimer's disease. Right. Okay. There it is. So Good. the um, the mechanisms, at least partly, are known, as well as the fact that uh, there's a strong association between exposure and yeah. the sickness. Yeah. Okay, uh, it's not too big a stretch, is it, I think, for most people listening at this point in time to understand that as um, organisms uh, interacting with our planet, um, what we've been exposed to in the last 100 years or so is probably never, we were never probably meant, to, well, I say we probably were never meant to be exposed to it, but it's certainly having a pretty big impact on us and obviously uh, our best interest is to try and work it out and deal with it. So... In terms of the uh, effects of non-ionizing radiation and uh, the way our brains, you said our brains are uh, interacting with our environment, with our planet, because uh, we're born of this planet and this planet resonates at a certain frequency. As beings of light, uh, perhaps that's another way of looking at us. Um, uh, the other effects of the other radiation that are uh, non-ionizing that we're exposed to, um, what, do you, uh, what do you think about the uh, likely potential uh, uh, health effects 
of light therapy? No, no, I was going to ask Dr. Pete what he was, um, he, he was going to perhaps talk a little bit about the uh, negative health effects of uh, the electromagnetic radiation. Oh, uh, yeah, the, um, the very basis for the government uh, policy ever since uh, that uh, 1947 to 50 uh, study based on uh, jars of salt water heating up uh, the, the very basis for the whole policy is the image of the organism as a bag of chemicals in water, okay. all the water solution, <laughs> an absolutely never founded uh, model <laughs> of what the organism is. Right. Uh, so it's it's a, it's a horrible fantasy idea which leads all of these uh, corporate and government people to say. Right. Oh, there's no danger. Right. Uh, you're just a bag of, of chemicals in salt water. Mm -hmm. and so a reductionist uh, principle, huh? Uh, yeah, and uh, that part of the uh, problem there is that uh, that policy is reinforcing an anti-scientific attitude in the universities and in general uh, public understanding of what an organism is. Uh, St. Georgie was one of the early people uh, recognizing that uh, life is an electronic process. And uh, Alexander Gervich, uh, even 20 or 30 years before St. Georgie, uh, was demonstrating that cells communicate uh, through uh, light. In the case of his experiments, it was in the ultraviolet region. Uh, but St. Georgie... Uh, emphasize that uh, resonant electrons can travel through the organism uh, at, and that that opens up the possibility for for these um, resonant interactions between uh, other frequencies not just the high energy uh, Gervich rays but the uh, very low energy rays which can resonate with groups of electrons that are behaving like an antenna uh, where uh, the reductionist sees uh, our cells as simply groups of atoms, each atom being the only thing which right. can uh, absorb radiant energy. Right. The St. Georgie model is that uh, great molecular spans uh, integrate cellular processes uh, by conductive electrons. So we are like an electrical piece of equipment. Yeah, and uh, the, uh, in the late 1940s, uh, two Romanians uh, were the first ones to uh, show uh, coherent electronic interaction uh, producing microwaves. They basically invented the Maser or the microwave amplification by stimulating emission of radiation, okay. uh, the uh, microwave equivalent of the laser. Right. And uh, just this last summer, uh, some Englishmen uh, found that they could uh, make a, a maser that operates at room temperature uh, by a coherent interaction of electrons at the microwave frequency. So now the, the physical uh, uh, non-reductionist uh, approach to matter is uh, established that, that masers do exist and can work at room temperature. So now we can go back and say St. George's uh, thinking wasn't okay. entirely unrealistic. He was describing uh, the chemistry or, or physics of a maser uh, operating in the organism, but now we know that it's actually a thing that can be manufactured and exist at room temperature. Got it. Okay, we have a caller on the line, I think. Or oh. Hello? Hi, you're on the air. Yes, I have three specific questions I want to ask. I hope they can be addressed concisely. Uh, the first thing... Um, uh, Dr. Pete, you just touched very um, simply on uh, on uh, uh, um, 
pardon me, um, fluorescent light. Okay, you said that fluorescent light tubes were dangerous. And did you say that those little squiggly ones that they want us all to, uh, to use instead of incandescent light bulbs, are those bad for the eyes or the nervous system? Uh, I think for the, for the nervous system, especially because they emit in the radio frequency and microwave frequency. So those little squiggly fluorescent lights are related to microwaves? Uh, they do emit, yeah, that kind of radiation. Because um, they're uncomfortable to me. I don't like them. And uh, everybody tries to tell me that they're, they're, they're not as bad as the long tube old-fashioned ones and that they diffuse the light and that they're okay and that they're better than incandescent because they save energy. Now, yeah. if, if it saves energy, fine, but if it doesn't save the, per the energy of the person... And it costs more energy it, to make what? And the disposing of them is uh, very energy expensive exactly. because of the mercury in them. So you think it's, it's better to, to stick with incandescent bulbs? Yeah, I think they're still the best answer. LEDs, maybe. Okay. Now, my other question is, um, um, now, I don't have any computers or anything like that, but when I go visit my daughter, she's got all kinds of fax machines and computers and electronic stuff. And uh, when the lights go out, and she's got a lot of these in the guest room, and when the lights go out, um, these v lights, all these uh, different colors, green and blue and red uh, lights coming from the machines um, are powerful and penetrating. Uh, I, I can't, they're disturbing to my sleep, they're disturbing to my eyes, and I end up throwing pieces of cloth over them so to cover the lights so I don't have to see them. Are those harmful? I don't think the light itself is, but there's probably activity in the computer even when it's asleep. Well, why does it make such pungent light when it's off? Uh, they just have these little LEDs to um, indicate. So LED lights themselves are very, very powerful? I don't think the lights are especially harmful. Okay. Now, my other question is uh, about... Uh, microwave ovens, uh, uh, do you think that mic air microwave ovens are dangerous? I know you're supposed to not be in front of it. You push the button and get out of the way. But are they dangerous to use, and is the food bad for you that you eat this microwave? Um, the um, microwave is now pretty well shielded. In 1973, the Consumers Union recommended buying no microwave oven because they weren't properly shielded. But uh, now if you don't stand near them and just use them for a c couple minutes, uh, they aren't one of the worst problems. Okay, but what about the food you eat? Does it, uh, does it do something to the food to make it less nutritious or bad um, for you in any way? Uh, no, it's basically like boiling the food. Because I thought that it was... Uh, uh, it it um, stirred up the molecules and heated it up from the inside, and that that somehow was destructive to the nutrients. That's not true. Uh, no, it's it's just like boiling. Oh, it does uh, heat damage, but nothing much worse. And the other reason why the uh, fluorescent twirly things and the fluorescent tubes are bad is because they don't emit a lot of red light, which is what incandescents do. Yeah, they have always disturbed my nervous system and made me feel uptight around them. And people think I'm crazy. Well, thank you very much for your call, <laughs> and I hope right. we answered your questions. Okay, I think we have another caller on the line, so let's take this next caller. You're on the air? Hi there. Is that me? It is. You're on the air. Okay. Well, you know, this subject, I, I, I'm appreciating this show, uh, but I have, I'm a very long-term uh, person with uh, electromagnetic hypersensitivity, and I've studied this for a long, long time with some great experts in the field. And I respect your opinions very much, but you don't know the half of it, folks. And as someone who actually is a mine canary, A, I have to say that microwave ovens are not safe, that modern microwave ovens emit quite a, quite a heck of a lot of stuff. Uh, I have to stand, you know, like... Uh, six to ten feet away from all microwave ovens not to not to get pressure in my head i found that out in 1990 uh... the process of how you cook food in microwave ovens uh... it isn't exactly like boiling because the process that heats it up actually uh... does in fact impact uh... what would you call it the uh... the actual um, uh, the field of the food the uh, the textural 
quality of the of the electromagnetic bonds in the food. Uh, but worse than that is that there's so much ignorance out there, and there's so much electromagnetic pollution uh, because we we have been kept totally in the dark because of the money, just like tobacco. And and what I would urge, uh, first of all, there is no level of radiation, ionizing or non-ionizing, that is safe. You know, we've been you've been talking about it. I you know it's true. And yet, and yet. There's all these women walking around with cell phones in their bras. I just read an article today about, you know, the, the incidence of breast cancer right where you held your cell phone. Uh, you know, and they recommend you hold it five-eighths of an inch away from your flesh. And I'm like, oh, that'll slow it down a little bit, you know, and maybe it will. But the fact is that a huge amount of damage has been done over the last, just in the last 15 years, really, this explosion of stuff. And I'm really worried, guys. Because what I've looked at from almost dying from this is that, yes, you can supplement yourself with seaweed and you can get a hair test and find out what your, what your mineral balance is so you can get it back to normal so at least your body has half a chance to, to fight off some of this stuff and you can eat as well as you possibly can and as organic as you possibly can. But uh, 3 to 10% of the population like me are just not going to be able to function in civilization really uh, anyway. And the rest of the people don't know why they feel vaguely sick, you know. And so, you know, I am so looking for people with, with a solution, but I don't really see any solution except turning it off. Now, I, I realize that you may think I'm an extremist here, but I'm really not. I'm a pragmatist, okay? And what I see is that very, very slowly, after a whole bunch of horrible damage has been done, maybe we'll re regulate it mildly. And then it'll be so cool that the kids will uh, think that they have to have it because it's, it's banned. You know, the kids at the community school here in Mendocino used to take three or four Wi-Fi hubs, put them in a circle, point them inward, turn them on, and stand in the middle of it to get an effect like bad speed. Okay? Okay, so... That's, that's, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. Yeah, that's, so, that's fine. So I appreciate your comments. There's a huge problem here, yeah. and I would like to know... Do you have any solutions? We are, are going to discuss. Yeah. We are going to discuss some ways to and, protect yourself from this what EMF. About, what about the people who aren't just theoretically involved, but the people like me, and worse, the people who are hiding out in canyons in Arizona, you know, in their campers because they literally would have a heart attack or a stroke or, or you know, die. Yeah. Well, uh, let's. You know, uh, why these, don't are, you... these are scary yeah. things. Though. Okay. Appreciate your call, but rather than uh, rather than going on a, yeah, uh, a crusade, which I can understand you feel very uh, uh, personally about, let's uh, give us a moment to talk about some of the things that people can do to help themselves, and that will be more constructive than uh, just uh, damning the science, obviously, that's yeah. behind uh, promoting it. Okay, so appreciate your call. Um, okay, so Dr. Pete. Um, I, I should mention that um, in Scandinavian countries, uh, they're taking the... Uh, Ultra sensitivity to uh, electromagnetism in a few people uh, seriously, so mm -hmm. that uh, they're protecting schools. If if a student reacts to it, uh, they're uh, insulating the school or grounding the school uh, to uh, protect individuals who are super sensitive. Yeah. And are they doing that in the same way like we talked before with metal roofs and metal that connects the roof to the ground and the a plumbing that's in the ground metal plumbing yeah and even special paint that has a shielding effect yeah. it's, it's like anything else it, it's a fairly new technology but i think uh, if you talk about time you know it hasn't really been around for that long and we are gathering data all the time and the fact that there are negative effects coming out and released uh, in scientific uh, journals is obviously pushing the uh, quest for more information forward. And, and I think, I get, like I said, halfway through the show, I think we're at the, uh, the best alternative that we have at this point in time. And I think that's, hopefully, that's where the uh, human species is going. If we're going to be um, smart enough to work this out, we just need to keep seeing the evidence that's uh, there and uh, open our eyes and start thinking about the alternatives. I know money is always a driver of the industry, um, but I think when also when enough evidence is uh, brought to bear that people are getting sick, then I think there's enough political will to change things, and that uh, hand in hand with industry will will fuel the uh, the next generation. So I, you, you talked about. I want to quickly say that I. Uh, 
and pulled an article up actually just as we've been standing here uh, from the uh, jo- Journal of Borderland Research and um, there was a uh, little bit of an experiment that were done with uh, a group of people uh, to see whether or not they could perceive the, uh, EM, the ELF from about 7 uh, to 10 hertz and, and there was a definite sub, uh, proportion of the uh, um, subjects who could definitely definitely sense the uh, uh, the ELF that they were receiving through the uh, through the headphones and uh, so specific was it that they were uh, took about a quarter of a second for them to react to the on or off switch and there was nothing that they could physically hear or see but uh, their brains were definitely telling them that something was happening at that time so that's uh, pretty interesting what you said Dr. P about the schools in Sweden and what they're doing uh, to uh, shield the children but we do have another caller I think on the air so let's um, but let's we have to make it quick because we have to discuss some ways to yeah, help protect ourselves okay there we go let's I'll also briefly interject that there is a kind of police radar or speed radar that I can detect I found that out in a very interesting way but okay. it is possible and here is our last caller of the evening I assume perhaps yeah let's just take the caller Hi, you're on the air? Hi. Um, yeah, I wanted to make a comment about uh, this documentary I watched recently called The uh, Light Bulb Conspiracy. And it talked about something called the International Energy Cartel, which it shows documents like internal memos and stuff, how they control like how long uh, household products last, like a thousand hours for light bulbs and all this stuff. That's right. so why, like, back in the day, things would last. Right. I wonder if that has anything to do with. Uh, you know, renewing the bad energy that they can give to things and whatnot. But uh, I also get tension headaches from CFLs, and uh, I say something to everybody I come across that has those in their home, especially a lot of them. Uh, it's crazy because they got, I guess, tax breaks from the government. is like green energy stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're made overseas. They're all toxic. There's no waste disposal set up. So sure. my theory is that we're the waste disposal because... Yeah. You know, knocks people's IQ points down, and keeps them from resisting and stuff like that <laughs> against, uh, I guess we call it New World Order. Um, but anyways, I don't think it's about money, as uh, one of your other callers talked about. I think it's really about power because powerful people are the ones that control the money. Um, and then basically my, my question is about directed energy weapons. Like they use them against what they call riots, which are protests when people are conspiring against the world, uh, that kind of a deal. And also the work of uh, Nick Begich, who talks about the Heart Project with all the radio antennas. They generate resonant frequencies and bounce off the ionosphere. I want to know if you knew a bit like that uh, or about that. And I just wanted to finish the comment that it seems like a pretty high-level conspiracy against people like worldwide to, you know, expose them to these fields. And uh, that's all I have to say. Okay. I'll uh, hang up and listen to your response. All right. Thank you for your call. I think... Uh, thank you. Do- I think, Dr. Pete, what we'd like to do is really talk about what people can do to help themselves, and let's focus the uh, next, the last part of this show on uh, positive things. I know you've um, you've written doc- articles about uh, the uh, hormones, uh, testosterone and progesterone, being very pro active and anti-inflammatory and even in uh, for EMF and the free radical damage that can happen. It's certainly applicable. Yeah, uh, their deficiency is involved in all of the degenerative diseases, uh, heart disease, uh, sudden death from heart stopping, um, Alzheimer's disease, uh, they're deficient, and uh, especially relative to uh, the estrogen level. Uh, Men with Alzheimer's have high estrogen, low testosterone, and uh, uh, all kinds of Injury, whether it's ionizing radiation or uh, electromagnetic waves, uh, longer waves and microwaves and so on, uh, these all lower testosterone and progesterone. And they all cause the cells to increase more estrogen and serotonin, right? Um, yeah, and uh, so it's it's not surprising that the that the radiation. Non-ionizing causes the same diseases that ionizing radiation does because they're all affecting the same basic physiology, lowering our protective hormones. And uh, the um, one of the types of of uh, radiation I, I didn't mention was what they're using now in uh, airport scanners, uh, okay. the, the ones that aren't X-rays are in the millimeter uh, wavelength. And um, about uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago, the Russians 
were working on uh, the effects of those, uh, which are they're very useful for navigation and and various communication uh, purposes. But uh, because they were uh, starting to um, put them into practice, they studied the biological effects and found that that wavelength is is especially important in cell communication. And and so, the, uh, as with the other frequencies, uh, the TSA is telling the public that uh, that's a completely harmless uh, level of radiation. And the um, energy level they're using in airports for those scanners are, are about uh, 10 to 100 times higher than the Russian studies showed uh, are involved in cell control and cell communication. So if they, um, when you're standing in line to go through the security, if they tell you it's not an X-ray machine and it's like an ultrasound, that's what they told me, I just said, well, no thanks, I'd like to be patted down. But then they punish you. <laughs> they make you wait <laughs> oh, yeah. a long time. And then they're also very they gruff they, and they, rough when mm-hmm. they pat you down. They make you seem like a, uh, a, a an, anti-patriotic. <laughs> convict if you decide to decline the non-X-ray machine. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what about um, things in our home? So we can have our computers with the wireless switched off, plugged into plugs, and Ethernet cords for our computer Internet service. We can hold cell phones, if we have to talk on them, away from our head as far as possible and shout loudly or put it on a stand as far away as possible and shout loudly. Any other common um, practical recommendations for the unavoidable EMF that we're exposed to, Dr. At B? At this point. Uh, well, uh, using the simplest, older-fashioned technology like wires, yeah. I think, is, is very important rather than the, the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Uh, even the Bluetooth is, is emitting enough to uh, add to the uh, biological confusion. Well, you mentioned even if you put the little earpiece in your ear and it's connected to a wire to the actual cell phone, it would still be bringing um, some EMF, extra EMF to your brain. Yeah. In fact, any metal in the environment uh, is a potential uh, source of re-radiated energy. Uh, when I was uh, experimenting with uh, making biological detectors, I hooked up uh, my first detector uh, to my finger and got a radio station uh, coming out of out of my <laughs> body uh, showing that uh, I, I was resonating so strongly to that that I couldn't wow. pick up the, the energy I was trying to detect. Wow. <laughs> okay. And foods, Dr. Pete, can you mention yeah. some foods that are uh, EMF protective? Um. Things that are rich in magnesium uh, help to uh, uh, stabilize cells because all of the stresses, ionizing or non-ionizing radiation, uh, fatigue and stress cells cause them to take up and hold mag- or calcium, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, that displaces magnesium. So if you have a magnesium-rich diet, a phosphate-poor diet, and... Uh, avoid the polyunsaturated fat uh, to lower stress and uh, support the testosterone, progesterone, thyroid system. Uh, Those foods uh, offer considerable uh, defense. Uh, Caffeine is helpful uh, to the extent that it increases progesterone and testosterone and thyroid, for example helps with any kind of radiation resistance. So in the herbal world, um, nettle tea is very rich in minerals and um, raspberry leaf tea, any kind of green leaves. And in the vegetable world, you know, kale, chard, collards, those are all very, very magnesium-rich foods. Phosphate-poor foods, like you mentioned, Dr. Pete, are going to be um, milk and cheese and eggs. Uh, Eggs eggs have quite a bit, but not... And again, the greens... And the greens, right? They're phosphate poor. 
And the greens are good for you, aren't they? You see, <laughs> they told you they that when you were a child. <laughs> they don't right. have a lot of phosphorus. In <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Pete. Let's have a few minutes uh, on the air just to tell people more about you and how they can get hold of your information. So thanks so much for joining us. We really oh. appreciate it. And uh, again, it was uh, another chance for people listening to get some valuable information. So thanks a lot. Okay. Thank good you. Night. Good night. Okay, so for those of you who've listened to the show, um, Dr. Raymond Pete has a website, www.raypeat.com. Uh, lots of peer uh, published articles that are scientifically um, referenced, so not just hearsay. Uh, he's been delving into this information for the last 40 years or so. So uh, he's a research endocrinologist with a. Uh, a very big brain, and he's, uh, he's got a lot of information in there to share with people, so uh, always pleased to have him on the show. Um, okay, so for other people that who perhaps have uh, listened to the show, um, we can be contacted uh, Monday through Friday, uh, 9 to 5 p.m., uh, the toll-free number is one eight 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 wbm herb uh, We can be reached for consultations uh, via Dr. Pete through that number um, until December, the third week of December. December 21st. Month, December the 21st. There we go. That's the winter equinox. So we've had two equinox on the show this year. <laughs> okay. Anyway, thanks so much for listening. Uh, I hope people get some valuable information and can uh, benefit from it. Anyway, to those of you who have ears, let them hear. My name is Sarah Murray. My name is Andrew Murray. Good night. Good night.